you want to install your own antenna and radio station at home for ham radio or GMRS, well, I just installed this awesome rooftop antenna for ham radio and connected it into my shack. And I'm going to take you through the entire process step by step, including all of the materials, all of the connections, whether it's for ham radio, GMRS, whether you want to mount it on your roof like this or mount it on the chimney or some other place to make it easy for you to do a similar installation. Coming up. If you've ever been frustrated with the range and results you get with just a handheld ham radio, installing a rooftop antenna for VHF and UHF is an incredible station upgrade. I just installed a rooftop antenna at my home and I'm gonna take you step by step through the entire process to make it easy for you to install your very own permanent antenna and base station radio. In this guide, I'm going to be installing a dual band vertical antenna for VHF and UHF for the two meter and 70 centimeter bands, which are the frequencies most commonly used for local ham radio communications and repeaters. VHF UHF frequencies are line of sight communications, which means depending on factors like antenna height, power, and obstructions, you can reach about 25 to 30 miles of range or even further, plus you can extend your signals using repeaters. And if you wanna go worldwide, you can further enhance your home ham station by adding a simple wire antenna like an NFED halfway for HF, AKA high frequency, which I'll cover in another video. But having a great VHF UHF antenna is an important part of any complete ham radio station for reliable local communications. I'm also going to include a text guide along with this video with more detailed instructions and links to all the materials for your easy reference. A quick note about safety. The information in this video is provided for educational purposes only. Working with antennas, electrical systems, and rooftop installations can be dangerous and involves risks such as falls, electrical shock, or property damage. You are responsible for your own safety. Always follow local building codes, electrical codes, and regulations in your area. And when in doubt, consult or hire a licensed electrician or professional installer. We are not responsible or liable for any injury, loss, or damage that may result from attempting to replicate or apply the information shown here. Operating on ham radio frequencies without a license is illegal and can lead to hefty fines. So if you need to get a ham radio license or upgrade, just go to hamradioprep.com and take our courses. It only takes a couple of hours and we even have a mobile app so you can study on your phone. Now let's dive in. The main components of the station are the antenna, the mast, which is just the pole that holds up the antenna, the radio itself, the coax cable and grounding wires that connect everything together, and a dedicated ground rod for our new antenna system. Anytime you're installing a permanent ham radio antenna system, you need a dedicated ground rod to protect from lightning and dissipate any static charge from building up on the antenna or mast. This is actually way easier to install than you might think. You can pick up an eight foot copper grounding rod like this one from your local hardware store for about $25 and use a hammer drill with a ground rod driver to place it in, which you can also rent. Then you need to bond it, AKA connect it to your home's main ground using thick copper wire such as number six AWG. This is important to make sure your antenna ground and home ground are at the same electrical potential and prevents any surge or lightning from traveling through your equipment as the path of least resistance. If you have an old home that doesn't already have a dedicated ground rod, you'll need to get an electrician to install one to have your station set up correctly. We'll include links to a detailed video on how to install your antenna grounding rod with the text guide. The most important factor in your station performance is your antenna. For ham radio, we recommend a dual band antenna that covers the two main bands of two meters and 70 centimeters. This will allow you to make direct radio to radio simplex contacts with other people in your area, talk on local repeaters, or even receive signals from ham radio satellites. Generally, longer vertical antennas have better performance and gain, which give you better range, but there's a trade-off because they're heavier and longer. 
I've selected the Diamond X30A, which is just a couple feet tall and was the right size for my space. But there are lots of great dual band ham radio antennas, so I'll include some additional recommendations in the text guide along with the video. You can use pretty much any two meter, 70 centimeter ham radio with this antenna. You can even connect to your regular handheld radio. But for best performance, I recommend finding a base station dual band ham radio with at least 50 watts of power, which is much more than the five to eight watt power on most handhelds. I'll include a few great options in the text guide with this video. And again, there are lots of great options here. Personally, I'm using a Yaesu FTM 100D, which isn't even produced anymore, but it's still an awesome and performant radio. Next up, you need to decide where you're gonna mount the mast for the antenna. The mast, again, is just the pole that is going to hold the antenna up. There's a saying in ham radio, height is might. You want your antenna to be as high as possible for best performance. You've got a few common options for where to mount your antenna. If you have a good chimney, you can use a chimney mount with straps, or you could use an eave or wall mount, which lets you attach the mast to the side of your house with brackets or a mount. Finally, you could use a mount that goes right on the top of the roof, which is what I'll be using. Rooftop mounts come in various styles, such as tripod mounts, mounts that go over the eave, or mounts that drill directly into the roof like the one I'll be using, but you can seal them to prevent water damage and you can always replace the shingles later if you need to remove the antenna. I would definitely recommend taking a look at a mount like this one that goes over the eave of your roof if you want to try an option that doesn't require any holes in your roof. Very important is to make sure your mounting point is very far away from overhead power lines, at least twice the length of the antenna assembly. You do not want any chance that your antenna or mount is gonna touch a power line because that could be deadly. Don't be afraid to get creative with your mount and mast either. Ultimately, you just need a sturdy pole to hold up your antenna. Some people even use fence posts. Pick whatever style works best for you. And once you've picked a mast and a mount, it's time to install it. Since I'm installing directly into the roof, I'm going to use a one by six inch piece of pressure treated wood underneath my mount, which I'm also painting with the sealant and black paint to add extra stability. That's only necessary because of the type of mount I'm using, but it may not be necessary for you. I've picked out a spot on the highest part of my roof. I'm gonna drill pilot holes, then place two inch outdoor screws to the wooden mount to secure the mounting plate. Yes, unfortunately this is putting holes in my roof, but these are small holes. I'm gonna use a sealant tape to cover the holes later, and you can even purchase a sealing tape that is purpose-built to seal the holes underneath the mount. Now I'll connect the mast with the included bolts using a level to ensure the mast is as straight as possible. With the mast ready to go, let's put together our antenna on the ground before connecting it to the mast. Again, I'm using a Diamond X30A antenna. The Diamond X30A and similar antennas come with three radials that act as a ground plane to direct your signal and improve performance. Screw the radials into the side of the antenna and tighten the locking nuts to secure them. The antenna also includes a mount and brackets that will connect to the mast. You can see here an example how the antenna will be mounted. The cylindrical mount is going to connect to the mast using the provided brackets. The coax goes through the center of the mount into the bottom of the antenna. Then the two provided bolts are used to secure the antenna to the mount. Back at the mast, attach the cylindrical mount using the two brackets provided and tighten until firm. This is going to hold our antenna. Now you're ready to attach the antenna to the mount. For this step, you'll also need coax and electrical tape with zip ties for strain relief. Using high quality, thick coax cable is really important because you can lose a lot of your signal in bad coax, especially for VHF and UHF frequencies. I recommend LMR400 or RG8X coax, which are thicker coax that will perform really well under these frequencies. Your coax cable should be as short as possible to minimize the losses, so consider the shortest distance to your station or ground. I already have my coax ready to connect with the correct length before I mount the antenna. Pass the coax through the mount and screw it firmly into the bottom of the antenna. Then use the two bolts provided to screw the antenna into the mount. Since we're using heavy coax cable, let's add some strain relief. I'm gonna create a loop with the antenna and secure it using a zip tie and electrical tape. This will reduce the force of the coax on the antenna and make it last longer. Here's a close up. You can see our antenna is coming into the antenna mount. We have our two bolts with locking washers that are connecting the antenna to the mount. Here is where our mount is connected here to our mast. And then our coax is coming up through the antenna mount and we have strain relief here with a zip tie and black electrical tape. 
All right, guys, with our antenna installed, it's time for a sanity check, and we're gonna hook our antenna up to our antenna analyzer and make sure that it is performing correctly before we go ahead and connect it up to the shack. If you don't have an antenna analyzer, that is okay too, but this is a very, very good time to check and just make sure our antenna is performing correctly. I'm using the common antenna CEA 500 Mark II, as you can see here. And this antenna is gonna be for two meters and 70 centimeters. So I'm gonna check the SWR and the resistance on those two bands. So you can see this has a connector here for 1.8 to 300 megahertz at the top and it has a separate connector for 300 to 500, which we'll need to use for the 440. So let's go ahead and turn this on and we'll change to the two meter band. So that's gonna be around, well, there we go, 142. Let's get it close to 146.52. That's the national calling frequency. All right, and you can see here, our SWR is really close to one. It's like almost the perfect one. And our resistance here is very close to 50 ohms. So that is looking absolutely awesome. That's perfect. It's exactly what we want to see. With your antenna in the air, I know you're getting anxious to plug up a radio and start operating, but just a few more steps for safety and station performance. You need to install a lightning arrestor in the coax between the antenna and before it enters your ham shack. The lightning arrestor also needs to be connected to ground, and since the coax shield is also connected to the device, this is going to ground our coax shield too, acting as a ground block for the coax. The lightning arrestor is a critical component. It's gonna act like a fuse in the event of a lightning strike, and it will help cut current away from your station and home and into the ground rod. Nothing is gonna protect you 100% from a direct lightning strike, but this is gonna help a lot. So connect one end of the coax coming from the antenna into the lightning arrestor. Connect the other end of the coax going to your ham shack. You can place the lightning arrestor at the point where the coax enters your ham shack, like a feed through or junction box. I'm gonna install it here near my dedicated ham radio ground rod, since the ground rod is already near the entrance to my ham shack anyway. Then make sure to connect the lightning arrestor to ground. First, I'll use a wire stripper to strip the insulation off the end of the 10 gauge green ground wire. I'm using a crimp to connect the ground wire to the connector on the bottom of the lightning arrestor. Then, connect the lightning arrestor to ground using a ground rod clamp like this one. Or, you can order an even better connector like this one for your ground rod. These come in various styles and connection types. You also need to ground the antenna mast. I'll strip the end and use a crimp connector then connect it to the mast. Because my mast appears to have some kind of powder coat, I'm also adding a jumper ground between the mast and the antenna mount. You just want to ensure that the entire mounting system is grounded with metal to metal contact. Back at the ground, I'll use the ground rod clamp again to secure the grounding wire to the antenna mast. A note about grounding wire here, 10 gauge is the absolute minimum thickness for grounding from the mast to the dedicated ground rod, and many people even recommend six gauge. A detailed guide on grounding and bonding is beyond the scope of this guide, but this should at least help you understand the fundamental requirements of grounding your lightning arrestor and mast. Remember, you need to have a dedicated ground rod for your ham radio antenna system, which is bonded to your main home ground using six gauge copper wire. Now we can run the coax from the lightning arrestor to the ham shack. I'm using a window feed through unit from Rocket Machine Works to pass through my window. Check out my full installation video on the feed through unit if you want some extra installation tips. And finally, the moment of truth, let's connect the radio and make some contacts. An easy way to try to make a contact is to tune your radio to the national calling frequency, 146.520 megahertz, and say your call sign plus, national calling frequency, looking for a contact. I tuned my radio to 146.520, said my call sign, and immediately made two contacts about 10 miles away. This is November Zero Whiskey Romeo Lima testing Simplex. I believe that was a Whiskey Zero Whiskey Romeo Lima. This is W4PGK, go ahead. Literally can't tell you how excited I am. I, I just got the new um, two meter, 70 centimeter Diamond X30 installed on the roof and the, I made my first call and you responded right back and the signal is so clear. I, I hooked it up to an SWR meter on two meters and it was close to one to one. To one. And this is just incredible. I mean, I've, I've been, uh, I've used handhelds and all of that, but having an actual permanent rooftop installation is just a game changer, over. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to do uh, simplex, it's, uh, it's, you, you pretty much have to have uh, an external antenna. <laughs> Unless you're just trying to talk to somebody down the street uh, or next door neighbor or something. But uh, yeah, for, for two meter uh, simplex, uh, you, you need something, uh, something outside Uh, 
I sure am. Is that W4KLL? This is N0WRL. Yes, it is. Um, first off, how you doing? The name here is James. Um, just curious, what kind of radio you're running? I heard the Model A Senna, but it's getting better radio. Hey, thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for coming back. Um, how's my uh, signal there for you? I mean, you're coming through just incredible here. Well, I've not had the GPA. I've had a few for highway proper. Smart yet. you're coming in five nine. That was awesome. You can also program your radio to a local repeater now and make repeater contacts. And there you go. I hope this guide was helpful in setting up your very own VHF, UHF ham radio base station. I absolutely love this station setup and I hope you are just as excited with your station setup. Now that the mass is set up, you can also try different antennas as well. I have HF capabilities as well here in my shack, so be sure to check out our videos on setting up an HF antenna such as an in-fed half wave, which is my recommended first HF antenna. Once you have HF as well as VHF and UHF capabilities, you will have a really awesome fully featured station. And setting up HF might be easier than you think. There are also lots of ways to improve this station. For instance, I can go back and improve the cable routing and use electrical tape to seal all of my coax connections. There are also some topics we didn't get to cover in full depth for the sake of time, like bonding your ground rod to your home ground. Be sure to drop a helpful comment if you have some tips or areas of improvement that might help other hams. This is how I installed my station, but there's still lots of areas of improvement and I'm sure other people out there have great tips as well. If installing a permanent mass and antenna like this one seems a little overwhelming, don't be afraid to experiment with portable, temporary dual band antennas and mounts as well. Try operating with an antenna on your balcony before going for a permanent installation. And remember, check out the text guide that goes with this video for more detailed instructions and links to all the materials and supporting documents. As always, this is James in Zero WRL saying 73, and I hope to hear you on the air soon, hopefully with your new mobile base station. We've helped over 60,000 students get their US FCC amateur radio license, and we can help you too, no matter your age or educational background. Go to www.hamradioprep.com and try a free lesson today.